Hey, this is Jody with WeldingTipsAndTricks.com with another weekly video. I picked this up off Craigslist not too long ago. It's an ACDC Miller Thunderbolt, and I'm going to be doing some scratch start TIG as well as some simple stick welding stuff. So let's get right to it. This week's video will strictly be doing scratch start TIG. I tried to work in some stick and it just didn't work out this week, but I'll, I'll get it soon. So first thing I'm going to do is kind of lay out this uh, inch and a quarter pipe and I went to metalgeek.com and you can go there and you can search for tubing coping calculator and you'll find a place where you can plug in the the uh, diameter and the wall thickness of whatever you're wanting to cut and it'll spit you out a PDF template that you can print out and use for a, a template to mark the end of a pipe and it actually works very well and you'll know that it, it sized it right if the ends meet like that if you don't don't save it as a PDF don't print it as a PDF there's a chance it'll scale and, and uh, be wrong but if the, if the ends meet you'll know you're right now this is my third strong hand nomad table I got three of them because they're just that handy I got one at one guy's shop that I leave there when I go do work and I've got one hanging on the wall and it, when I want to go outside I'll just pull it outside if I want to grind not get grinding dust inside and so that's what I'm doing here you see I'm holding I'm using the, one of those uh, vice grip type things with a v-pad on it to hold it down and I'm cutting this stuff with a 045 cutting wheel and a four and a half inch grinder. And actually it's going really quick. Now I've got it sped up here to about twice normal, but still makes pretty short work of, of this stuff. It's about 0.166 wall. And so that's somewhere around 532nd of an inch. I'm not really sure how many, uh, that's probably about four millimeters. And I'm cleaning this up with a flap disc going to do some final tune up on it to cope the uh, the fish mouth there so that I won't have any big gaps eyeballing it there and that's close enough and then I'll clean all this uh, hot rolled stuff off the uh, all the coating off the pipe because for TIG welding you, you want it clean scratch start or not you, you definitely want it as clean as possible and I'm going to get a tack right there and when I do I know it's going to pull a little bit in one direction so I choose which side to get attack on so that, you know, accordingly. So if it needs to come in one direction, I'll, I'll attack it in that, on that side. Now I'm using that little wooden homemade do-it-yourself foot switch, and that's the reason I didn't have to snap out of that. And that lets me keep the tacks shielded and nice and shiny so I won't have to weld over oxidized metal. And that is kind of a benefit. Not necessary, just a benefit. You hear the, you probably heard the foot switch squeak there. This is what it looks like. You see the arcs right there. It's, it's a knife switch, for, an automotive knife switch. And look here. What happened here? I forgot to turn on the torch valve. Forgot to turn on the argon, and that's what it looks like when you forget to turn on the argon. It oxidizes your electrode and usually erodes the tip and put some porosity and stuff in the, into the uh, wherever you did it. And so I want to grind all that junk out. Don't want to just weld over top of that. Get it all nice and cleaned out. And then it welds, welds nice again. I'm tacking it up with a small rod. Just using a 1 16th rod to get, to get nice, uh, nice tacks on here. And that's a nice shielded tack that will be easy to weld over again. The reason for it being shielded is because I use that. So I'm going to position it up here. Up overhead a little bit. So we can... Uh, walk around this thing and maybe learn something while we're doing it and I almost forgot to turn on the argon again on the torch valve so you strike it kind of like a match on usually that's one way anyway on on uh, scratch start you can also use the tip of the rod to flick and get the arc started and I also have seen people flick one end and then and then twirl the other end of the rod around like a drummer with a drumstick so that they don't uh, any, have any risk of contaminating uh, an x-ray uh, well that's going to be x-rayed with tungsten particles but for today we're not really too worried about that so for the most part I'm trying to just leave the rod in but occasionally it comes out and I'm you know a little shaking little arms wrapped around the camera I'm, ta I'm taking on this is actually two different pieces here I'm trying to shoot one of them to get some get some uh, hand positioning shots and then another one whole separate one for the arc shots because the camera's pretty close. But for the most part I'm trying to leave the rod in there. It's a 1 8 rod which is 3.2 millimeter. I'm using a 332nd tungsten, a 2.4 millimeter. It's hard to tell that when the when the uh, 
images magnified so much I'm zoomed in sometimes a lot. And I'll position one like this too. So we're welding the bottom and the top and then the sides vertical up. Now what I would do here is I would weld the bottom first because that's going to, the weld metal is going to shrink and if I weld the whole thing from bottom to top it's going to really want to draw up but if I weld uh, a good inch or so on the bottom first then the weld metal will shrink and it'll kind of pivot on those two side tacks and it'll pull it downward a little bit, not much, just a little bit, but then it'll, it's easy to pull it upward. It's going to want to pull upward because I, and I can weld uphill even just the sides and it'll pull it. It'll always pull in the direction of the travel of the, the bead. So I'm going to go ahead and weld probably an inch and a half or so of this bottom and then I'll weld, let it cool for a minute and then I'll weld the top part and then we'll, I'll join the two parts together by welding the sides vertical uphill. So again, I'm around 125 to 130 amps, 3.2 millimeter filler rod, ER70S2, using the lay wire technique, just doing a little weave pass. Now I need to check it for square, and it pulled it downward just a little bit, probably in the length of that blade, uh, maybe a little bit less than a sixteenth, and that's good because I know it's gonna it's gonna pull up when I weld the the top part. All right, let's do that. Light up there. A little shot of that real quick. Looks a lot like the rest, doesn't it? <laughs> Sped it up a little bit here. Okay, so got sections welded on the bottom and the top. Now we're going to pull a square out here and do a little quick check to see where we're at. And it's pretty good. Pretty close. And it's not going to move a whole lot with having that much weld on the top and the bottom. And you can see where I use the foot pedal to stop. They're nice shielded areas. I don't even have to wire brush them. I can light up on the one and then tie into the other and have it not uh, oxidize and get all squirrely and flaky and everything as I get there. So that's where the foot pedal helps. It, it kind of looks a little hokey, but it actually is a pretty big benefit for certain jobs. All right, let's see if we can get a better view of this one. There we go. It's funny when I watch these things after I after I weld and after I film, watch them when I'm editing, I'm always seeing things that I didn't previously see. So it lets me learn a little bit. Pretty instructive. Let's me learn I need more practice sometimes. <laughs> I decided to put on this Jackson Next Gen helmet. I hadn't used it in a while. Just making sure and keep the batteries kind of up to date in it. And the square, I need to snip the corner off that thing so I can check it with fillet welds on it. But it's very square. Well, some, a few little highlights on the setup on Scratch Start TIG. You need an air-cooled TIG torch, preferably with a valve. Not a must-have, but you got to remember to reach over to your flow meter and turn it off every time. And the valve is much more convenient. Air-cooled torches come in different numbers, the smallest bit usually being a, a, a 9 style, and then there's a 17, and then there's a 26, and 17 is the most common. With a 17, see, this is, a, this, is like a, this is like a 26. I think this came along before they even numbered them 26. It's a heavy-duty 200-amp CK torch. CK210 series, it's called. So it's a big, it's a big beefy torch. Um, it's a flex head, but I put a stubby kit on here to shorten it up. Otherwise, it's, it's really big. So um, that's another option. You can put a stubby kit on a 17, and then you got yourself something workable. Holds enough, carries enough heat, uh, so it doesn't just get hot even at welding at 100 and 125 amps, but also small enough with the stubby kit to get in some tight areas that you would get into in building a, a roll cage or something like that. This torch has two lines on it. One's just a power cable, one's the argon cable, and the argon cable hooks directly into the flow meter. Power cable, you just take the stinger, which should be hooked into the electrode negative, or at least in this case, that has a polarity selector on this thunderbolt. Clamp the stinger onto the, the power end, whether it's a, a tab like this or a little power block adapter. Clamp it on there and you're live, okay? 
Now, well, you're live at the tungsten now, so you got to be careful there. That's another benefit of having a little homemade foot switch, so you're not live all the time. You can lay the torch on the table without arcing out on something, as long as you have the pedal and the switch in the off position. There's another little view of the switch. I'm not going to talk about it a whole lot more, but uh, in case you're wondering, it is a, I think it's a 650 amp knife switch. I just ordered it off of Amazon. It's really intended to be used for automotive applications to disconnect a battery, keep somebody from stealing your tractor or your car or vehicle or whatever. Uh, this is the face of the Miller Thunderbolt. You can see I've got a polarity selector here. You're always going to want to be on DC negative, DC straight. On this machine at the lowest setting on 30 amps, I was able to run a bead on some 11 gauge and cranked it up to about 125-ish for the rest of it. You know, Scratch Start TIG is actually used for some really high-end applications. It's still used a lot for nuclear plant pipe piping, even critical food service type stuff. So it, it, it actually works best in the hands of somebody that's got some skill. It's probably not the best way to get started TIG welding. It is a very simple setup. It's fairly inexpensive if you already have a DC stick machine. If you don't already have a DC stick machine, you go out, like I spent 350 on this one, now you gotta get a, a bottle of Argon, that's probably gonna be at least 175. Well, you're at 525 now, you need a TIG torch for about 100, 625, flow meter another 170, 725. You know, that's, that's quite an investment to have in a, in a machine that you have no amperage control, no ability to maintain shielding gas and all that stuff in. But if you've already got, you've already got a stick welder, an AC-DC stick welder or straight DC stick welder, now, you know, you, you're going to have to eventually get a, a bottle of Argon anyway if you ever do get a TIG welder. So it's a good way to dip your toe in the water with some TIG welding if, you, if again, it's economical only if you already have a stick welder. All right, well, that is it for scratch start TIG welding for this week. But remember, since this is a TIG welding video, remember that there are three main things that you're, you're going to do wrong when you're learning how to TIG weld. And that's too long an arc, too much angle, and not shielding the tip of that rod. And here's what happens when you do all three. The heat is just not getting down into the corner of this little lap joint here. It's melting the top corner, it's melting the bottom, it's boomerang shaping, but it's not getting where it needs to go. It's not flowing right. There's crud flowing around in the puddle. Didn't change a thing didn't increase the amperage or turn it down or anything and I, all I did was tighten up the arc length tighten up the torch angle and shield the tip of the rod and you can see how much better it's going okay well before I say goodbye for this week this is just a reminder that I put all my videos every year that I post onto a four disc set of DVDs and this is this is what it looks like and they're indexed really nice on four discs it takes four discs to put them on because there's almost eight hours worth of content on there because it's a whole year's worth of videos there's a nice menu on the very back telling exactly which videos are on each disc. So if you're interested in this, go to WeldmongerStore.com. Hey, thanks for watching. We'll see you next week.